going to okay okay welcome to this walls webinar about rights to clean water in georgia next slide thanks to henry jackson the flint river keeper turning the slides and doing all sorts of other things um, so this is a webinar by Wells Watershed Coalition, Inc. I'm the moderator, John Quarterman, Swanee Riverkeeper. And uh, Chuck O'Neill is going to be on for questions about right to clean water in Florida. And before that, uh, Chris Bertrand, still a riverkeeper, is going to give a legal brief. Damon Mollis, a Geechee Riverkeeper, is going to talk about applications of right to clean water. And Gordon Rogers is going to explain how it can be done in Georgia, Gordon Rogers Plant Riverkeeper. And after all that, we'll have questions and answers. Please save your questions until then, and uh, we will attempt to answer them. Next slide, please. Okay, I'm, uh, as I mentioned, the Swanee Riverkeeper. Half the Swanee River Basin is in Georgia, half in Florida. So I'm sort of schizophrenic, that explains the hair. And, um, in Florida, there's this outfit called Waterkeepers Florida, which has as members all 14 Waterkeepers of Florida. And I moved with them to support right to clean water in 2021, and they did. In Georgia, I started a statewide committee about right to clean water, which compiled the information we're presenting in this webinar. All of today's presenters are members of that committee. We're speaking for ourselves. This Walls webinar is the first public presentation of this material. Next slide, thank you. Uh, Walls been around since 2012, 501c3 nonprofit. That's our current mission. We added to it recently groundwater. One reason for groundwater, uh, here I'll give you an example. Uh, Valdosta is near the Rithacoochee River. And just west of the Rithacoochee River is a sinkhole called Shadrick Sink, been there for many decades. When the Rithacoochee is high, the water goes down into Shadrick Sink under the river, several miles to the east where Valdosta's water wells are. Presenting Valdosta with the choice, they could either pay for much more expensive equipment to deal with the uh, tannic acid and, and biological components of the river water, which interact the re regular treatment chemicals to form toxic byproducts, or they could just drill the wells twice as deep, which is what they did. They drilled the wells deeper. So south of the fall line in Georgia and most of Florida, of course, uh, very few people drink from surface water. It's all groundwater, and the groundwater and the surface water interchange. So that's very important. And since 2016, I've been the Sewanee Riverkeeper, a staff position and a project to have walls as the Waterkeeper Alliance member for the Sewanee River Basin. Next slide, please. Uh, remember, if you have any questions at any point, please keep track of them and ask them when we get the questions and answers. So right to clean water is actually an idea that's been around for a very long time. In the year 530, the Roman Emperor Justinian revised the law book. And in there, he put this, by the law of nature, these things are common to mankind, the air running water of the sea and consequently the shores of the sea. <clears throat> there is a little more detail in there. For example, item four under that, the public use of the banks of the river is part of the law of nature, nations just as that of the river itself all persons therefore liberty to bring their vessels to the bank, to fasten roots to the trees growing there, and to place any part of their cargo there as to navigate the river itself. But the banks of the river are, are the property of those whose land they adjoin, and consequently the trees growing on them are also the property of the same persons. This sounds just like the stuff we're still talking about in Georgia and somewhat in Florida. Um, and in 1797, Thomas Paine, in a book called A Great Justice, about natural property, earth, air, water. So the idea has been around for a long time, <clears throat> but it needs uh, some fleshing out. And you know, what are the consequences? Next slide, please. Uh, 
Um, I think you missed one. Back up one more. Really? Okay. Uh, yeah, that one. The federal government has been making laws about clean water for quite a long time, starting as early as 1948. And these are good. They're, you know, the Clean Water Act, uh, there's a big celebration of that going on. It's the 50th year, but it's clearly not good enough. We still have huge problems with clean water, everything from uh, agricultural chemicals, um, fertilizers and pesticides getting into the water to forever chemicals to, well, Damon's gonna talk about that. <clears throat> so we need something more basic, a constitutional amendment that was tried at the federal level back in the 60s, never flew. So start with the states. <clears throat> Next slide, please. <clears throat> a bunch of states, <clears throat> excuse me, have amendments that say they're for you know, environmental rights amendments or rights to clean air and water, but uh, so well were defective for reasons we'll discuss in later slides. Three of them are generally considered pretty good, Pennsylvania, Montana, and New York. The first two passed way back in the 70s when Earth Day was young, New York just last year. New York's is one sentence, that's it right there. Each person shall have a, light, a right to clean air and water in a helpful environment. Now, brief is good, but there is such a thing as too brief. Next slide, please. In um, 1999, the Congressional Research Service did this report, which these quotes are from, where the Constitution's silent decisions are mixed, as in people can argue about all sorts of things. And so at least the major such issues should be addressed textually as in the text of the amendment to spare the affected parties in the courts a potentially long period of uncertainty. In Pennsylvania, decades to establish, and you know, Delaware Riverkeeper had a lot to do with this, finally in a court decision that the environmental rights amendment in, in Pennsylvania is self-actuating. You do not have to have additional enabling legislation. So individuals or groups can sue based directly on the Constitution. So that's a good thing, but it took a long time to establish. It'd be better to, you know, like say it in the amendment. Lacking one or more of the following things. Mentioning a healthy environment, uh, trustee, posterity, and if you're making the state the trustee for posterity, then that makes it possible for a judge to interpret that the amendment is anticipatory and preventative. Uh, Self-executing, inherent inalienable, standing remedies. These are all important things. Local laws, prohibition of state preemption, a big problem in Florida. Um, so standing and remedies. In Georgia and in Florida, as in every state in which one of these has been passed and every state in which one of these is being tried, they're all about human rights. Um, one has to be careful when doing that, that a judge doesn't interpret it too narrowly. Uh, I live three miles from the Withacuchi River. Now, I should be able to sue if the Withacuchi River is damaged. And I don't need a judge saying, is you? personal well polluted? If not, you have no standing. That's, that's not what we're aiming at. The amendment needs to somehow clarify that. And remedies, if I do get standing and who knows, win the lawsuit, the remedy should not be, we'll fix your personal well. I mean, okay, I want my well fixed, but I want the river fixed. That's the most important thing. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, without rights to clean water, here's an example of what happens. State of Iowa, there was a lawsuit, depending on what was already in the Iowa Constitution and the public trust doctrine. Remember Justinian back in 530, that was the beginning of the public trust doctrine. Okay, and the, the Iowa Supreme Court split decision, but this is what they ruled. A favorable decision would not remedy the harm from pollution in the river. 
And besides, the case raised political questions the legislature, not the courts, should resolve. So the court did not let the lawsuit go ahead, even though it said it was a real environmental problem. And without some solution, agricultural water pollution would continue unabated to pollute the Raccoon River. So here's a judge basically saying, we need a right to clean water. He didn't say it in that phrase, but he says, political problem, the legislature needs to decide. For the people. Next slide, please. So Iowa uh, HDR 12 was proposed on Earth Day in 2021. I believe it's back this year. And it has most of those things we previously discussed, common property of the people, present and future generations, trustee, self-executing. In addition to any rights conferred by the public trust doctrine or common law, it's all good stuff. And the rest of it is good too. Uh, so this is an example of a good one, and we hope it passes. Next slide, please. This is of what we've been able to find. There's a couple others that are not in the tables because we can't find the actual bills, but this is plenty. Uh, Florida is starting up a petition again this year, this month, for to try to get it on the ballot in for 2024. Um, half of these, since we first did, or since uh, Karen first did this research, oh, I don't know, six months ago, half of these have come back into the legislature. There's a bunch of 22s in here. None of them have actually passed yet, but persistent. Um, the New Jersey one, I think this is at least the third year it's been in the legislature. And they're in varying degrees of getting all those precarious of them, it's hard to tell. Some of them, like Kentucky, no, no future generations. Um, and a question that's come up, does future generations mean that you could, could conceivably use a right to clean water to sue about something that hasn't happened yet? Apparently the answer is yes, because in Montana, some youth have done exactly that about climate change. And a judge recently, uh, last fall, Yes, you can go ahead because, yep, that's what it's for. Anticipatory and um, preventative. That's where I got that phrase from. There's some other examples we may come to later about things it could be used for in anticipation. Next slide, please. Chuck O'Neill, who's on the call, is going to be available for answering questions at the end. He uh, headed a very successful campaign for right to clean water, which is in the charter of Orange County, Florida, home of Orlando and uh, Disney World. And that is now the, uh, well, I'll talk about that more in a bit. And the statewide campaign is starting in Florida this month. I will talk a bit about the Florida right to clean water and Chuck will be available for the Q&A. Next slide, please. Okay, um, why does Florida want such a thing? Well, if you look at the Florida Constitution, it's got all sorts of good stuff in there. I've used as an example, the outstanding Florida water designation, including the Solani River, the Aquatney River, the Apalachicola River. I pick these examples because they all include water coming from Georgia. And outstanding Florida water is supposed to mean developers have to prove no harm. But anybody can, from Florida could name a bunch of cases where that just didn't happen. My favorite example, or least favorite, is uh, the Sable Trail natural gas pipeline in a court case wall started in 2015. And in Florida, a representative from the Florida Department of Environmental Protection sat there under oath and when asked about each of the, I think it's five criteria for outstanding Florida water. Well, of course, well, of course. One year later to the month, in the same geology, one of the things she and the pipeline people said wouldn't happen, happened under the Withlacoochee River in Georgia. They leaked drilling mud up from their drilling into the river. So something better is needed. Next slide, please. Um, people in Georgia should be glad it isn't as bad as it is in Florida yet, yet. 
Um, the picture on the left is what's commonly known as algae bloom or blue-green algae. It's actually cyanobacteria. Happens most every year off of much of the coast of Florida. Everybody knows where it's coming from. It's agricultural. It's uh, glyphosate from Roundup. It's phosphorus and nitrate from fertilizers. And the biggest culture, culprit is big sugar north of Lake Okeechobee. But the legislature, the governor, the uh, agencies have no willingness to directly address the problem. Then you get things like on the right. Those are mass. They're dying because their food source has been killed by the aforementioned agriculture runoff. Um, it mentions here uh, 400 in the first two months of 2021. Doesn't sound like a large number, but there's not exactly millions of manatees to start with. It's a problem, a big problem. Right to clean water would be another tool to address these things. Next slide, please. In Orange County, once this thing got on the ballot, 89% of Orange County voters said yes. There is no single party that can account for 89%. So that is a, a bipartisan mandate. And it also shows that you can't really have an economy without a healthy environment. You cannot separate the two. Next slide, please. So uh, I'm sure Chuck will correct me anything I get wrong here, which is why he's on the phone, on the Zoom. Uh, he is currently participating in a suit he started against the Secretary of the Florida Department of Environmental Protection and a developer, Beachline South Residential. They want a permit, of course. And the lawsuit alleges that if this happens, the government has the damage to the ecosystems of the waters and their potential destruction cannot be remedied by monetary damages or other relief. Naturally, the lawsuit wants denial. It's a tough road to hoe because there are many entrenched interests that want that development. So it's gonna be very interesting. Uh, this, these quotes are from an article in The Hill, a national publication. Uh, this suit is being watched by the entire country and the world. Florida is literally leading the world in this movement. Next slide, please. Okay, now, Chris Bertrand, who is the Satilla Riverkeeper, he is also an attorney. And he's written a five-page legal brief, which he will summarize. Chris is from Georgia. He worked at the Chattahoochee Nature Center. He's been a canoe instructor and outdoor adventure um, guide. And he went to University of Georgia Law School and environmental law. He's interned with Georgia Sea Grant, Chattahoochee Riverkeeper, others, including EPA Region 4. So um, next slide, please. Chris, please tell us about your legal brief. Thanks, John. And hey, everyone, I'm Chris. And today I'm going to talk to you all about what it actually means to have a right to clean water. What are the legal implications? And so what the right to clean water is doing, it's given our communities, our local governments, our um, local neighbors more tools in their toolbox in case they need to uh, stand up for their, their water resources in their community. And so there's four main things, four main new tools that this could give us. Um, there's additional ones, but these are the four main ones. And then specifically the fundamental right and the gap filler, those are gonna be the ones to really focus on. Um, but we'll get into that in a second. So if you could go to the next slide, please, Henry. Thank you. So when you think about a right to clean water, what you gotta think about is a fundamental right. And you already know what fundamental rights are, even though you might not know it. So other examples of fundamental rights, you got your freedom of speech, your freedom of religion, things you might not know as much about due process, right to marry, right to privacy, and there's more. But when someone says, oh no, government, you can't do that because that violates my freedom of speech. Now we're getting into fundamental rights. And what the right to clean water would do is someone would be able to say, no, no, government, you can't do that because that's violating my uh, right to clean water. And so this has given us a really high protection. A fundamental right gives us a high protection from the government. 
So if the government tries to pass a law that's violating our right to clean water or our right to freedom of speech, a court can hold that law unconstitutional. And next slide, please. Thank you. And so we're gonna break it down and go even more legal fundamental rights, what that looks like to the court. That means that they're gonna apply the strict scrutiny standard. And so what is the strict scrutiny standard? I'll give you an example in a little bit, but I'll tell you the definition first. So any law that the legislator passes that violates a fundamental right, if it violates the freedom of speech or it violates the right to clean water, it can still be held constitutional and still be okay. As long as it's narrowly tailored, it's super specific to achieve a compelling state interest, something that is necessary or crucial. And I'll give you an example of something you're familiar with. So the, the fire in the movie theater, um, yelling out fire in the movie theater, that can be illegal. Yeah, if you yell fire in the movie theater, technically, and creating a law that says that's illegal to yell that, technically it is violating your freedom of speech. It's restricting your speech, but it's not, it'll pass the strict scrutiny standard and it'll be constitutional because it's a very narrowly tailored um, instance of saying, yeah, you can't yell these really crazy things in movie theaters, gun or fire or whatnot. And that's really specific. It's a really specific type of speech in a really specific instant. It's narrowly tailored. And then it's also fulfilling a compelling state interest. You know, you don't want people running around, um, creating stampedes and chaos, intentionally harming people in our movie theaters. So it's something that would be considered necessary and crucial. Next slide, please, Henry. But something that we ought to note is that most laws aren't that specific and they're not fulfilling a compelling state interest when they violate one of these fundamental rights. And most laws are struck down by the strict scrutiny standard. So some examples of where in Pennsylvania, where we already have a right to clean water, something just like it, the Pennsylvania courts have applied um, the right to clean water to several provisions of the state fracking laws and have held those fracking laws unconstitutional saying no 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 they do not meet that strict scrutiny standard additionally the right to clean water it would be able to give us uh anyone a anti-backsliding tool to protect their water resources so another example of this is in pennsylvania again where they have something like a right to clean water and in that case the legislator wanted to preempt local governments from zoning oil and gas extraction. Local government said, we want to be able to say where you can and where you can't um, extract oil because we don't want them doing that near our water resources. And the state's like, oh, no, 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 we're going to preempt you. But then the court comes in and the court says, okay, you guys cannot do this because this is violating the right to clean water if you try to preempt this. Um, court used this as an anti-backsliding tool and held that law unconstitutional under the right to clean water. Next slide, please, Henry. Gap filler. So we got the fundamental right. That's, you know, that's our key right there. But we also have this other section, this other tool in our toolbox called the gap filler. And this is where a court could, in order to protect that fundamental right to clean water, that fundamental right to freedom of speech, courts could fill in a regulatory gap in the current law. And so what does this look like? Well, in Pennsylvania, there was a law that was passed um, by the legislature that allowed the environmental agency, their version of the DNR, to waive buffer requirements for companies drilling near water resources. The court intervened and said, you know, this waiver is unconstitutional. And why it's unconstitutional is because it doesn't go for farther, far, as far enough as it needs to go because this law does not provide any standards to protect water resources when a fracking company is seeking this waiver. It's not saying you can't frack near the water resources. You have to do this and this and this if you wanna frack near the water resources. So in this case, the court's saying, you know, this law it's passing, but it's not strong enough to protect the environment. Not that it's hurting the environment, but you need to put more, more meat in that, more meat on the bones if you wanna get this through and not violate the right to clean water. Next slide, please, Henry. Thank you. And then this one is a really unique tool. It's the, we call it the Natural Resource Trust Fund. It's coming out of Pennsylvania too. And 
in the Pennsylvania uh, Right to Clean Water Amendment, that Environmental Rights Amendment instructs the state to conserve and maintain Pennsylvania's natural resources for all people and all generations to come. And what the court has interpreted that to mean in case law is that any royalty proceeds from oil and gas leases um, on state forests need to be spent to maintain public natural resources and can't be sent to the general fund, aka money for environmental licenses and fees, they need to go to protect the environment. So that, that's pretty revolutionary what they did there um, and really beneficial. And that's something that could come out of a right to clean water. Any fees to uh, get some sort of water pollution permit, all that, that money collected needs to go to protect the environment. That's something a court could do um, as we see in Pennsylvania. And then last slide, please, Henry. Thank you very much. And lastly, uh, standing. So standing is getting into the courtroom. Um, you got to have, you know, a harm to get there. There's got to be causation. Um, you got to have a reason to be in the courtroom. John was alluding to this earlier. Um, if, and with standing, it's interesting because this is, uh, it's not as um, mm, defined or it's not as uh, laid out as it could be yet. It's kind of avant-garde. This is new stuff and the right to clean water is new stuff already. So this is pretty new, but I'll give you some food for thought with standing and it's related to the Montana cases where Montana has adopted a, uh, a environmental rights amendment. And the Supreme Court of Montana found that a right to a clean and healthy environment provides protections which are anticipatory and preventative. Uh, we could go more into that language later, but uh, it's pretty lawyerly. Uh, and then lastly, we got this great quote out there. Montana's constitution does not require dead fish to flow on the surface of the state's rivers and streams before those environmental protections can be invoked. So at the end of the day, it does look like with cases relating to the environmental rights, invoking the environmental rights amendment, standing could definitely be more liberally construed, could, be a, could have a broader scope. It's yet to be seen in other cases of maybe standing is, standing is expanded there. Um, but at the end of the day, which I really want you guys to focus on is that fundamental right that strict scrutiny standard and the gap filler. Those are the, the two biggest ones um, that are most important to think about. And uh, thank you all so much. And we'll throw it to the next guy. All righty. Um, Damon Mullis is the Ogeechee Riverkeeper. And he will present some examples of current waterway problems that rights to clean water would help address where current rules and laws don't seem adequate. He's from rural South Georgia, did a lot of outdoors fishing and exploring, and has bachelor's and master's of science degrees in biology from Georgia Southern University. Next slide, please. And he's done a lot of research and work in science, and he's run small businesses. And since 2018, he is the keeper. Damon, please tell us some examples. Thank you, John. Next slide, please. All right, so I was tasked with uh, coming up and, and looking at issues in Georgia and how rights to clean water would help protect our water resources because, you know, we already have laws and regulations. We have the Environmental Protection Division. We have the Clean Water Act. Uh, so how would this tool uh, help us protect our water resources in Georgia? And as Chris and, and John have already alluded to, uh, uh, you know, gap filler and uh, protecting our water resources when our regulatory state, regu state regulators fail us uh, is important and also standing. And, you know, to kind of give away the, the tagline, uh, in every instance I've looked at, uh, uh, having a right to clean water would help. Uh, and it really goes back to having that fundamental right. So next slide, please. So the first one I thought about immediately was uh, the fish kill on the Ogeechee River in 2011. Um, as the Ogeechee River Keeper, it's always present uh, in my mind. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, it, it was the worst fish kill in, in Georgia's history. 
Um, and this is an example of where state regulators uh, really failed the public and, and the citizens of Georgia in the Ogeechee River Basin. Uh, this facility was operating illegally for several years uh, and went undetected by uh, our regulators, added a new line, uh, did not have the permits required, uh, which eventually led to uh, the fish kill. Uh, after that, uh, we were, were, were able to use the Clean Water Act to hold the facility accountable, but um, it was not that easy. So the state of Georgia, even with all the evidence of the fish kill and what caused it, even to this day, has not acknowledged that this facility was, was the, the cause of it. Uh, even though the fish kill started right below their discharge pipe, all evidence pointed to them, the facility uh, destroyed evidence. And so that was problematic that the state regulators that are there to protect our environment, protect our water resources, we're working basically to protect uh, a facility that caused this tragedy. Uh, we did prevail, but in talking to the lawyers and people that worked on the case, having this would have been uh, a right to clean water would have really helped push things forward. It would have been easier to hold them accountable. The legal process probably would have happened faster and we may have got an even uh, better remedy than what we got. Next slide, please. The, the next really uh, uh, goes to emerging contaminants and that gap filler uh, that Chris talked about. So we know that there's lots of uh, chemicals and things that are being produced and discharged into our environment that causes problems, but the rules and regulations to, to, to prevent them from causing harm aren't in place yet. And so some examples are, are estrogen and other hormones, uh, pharmaceuticals that get discharged through wastewater treatment plants and our septic systems, uh, microplastics, which have been found in human blood recently, um, or, or an emerging issue that we're going to have to be dealing with for decades. And then probably the poster child now that everybody's talking about is PFOS. So PFOS is that forever chemical um, that we're finding also in our blood and everywhere, fish tissue. Uh, next slide, please. And, and we know PFOS causes lots of human health uh, harm. Uh, this is, a, is a, a, a picture from the Georgia uh, EPD's own website talking about the harm of two of the, the PFOS uh, species, PFOA and PFOS. Uh, they clearly go into details with links to the Center for Disease Control about how these chemicals in the human body uh, causes lots of problems and of, of our concern. That being said, uh, we've known about these chemicals for uh, a while now. We've known they've been dangerous for several years, if not a decade or more. Uh, and even according to EPD, they're in minimum five years away from actually regulating these chemicals. Now they've already contaminated drinking water up in North Georgia around Rome. We are found that they are contaminating fish tissue in the Ogeechee River, um, but there's nothing that anyone can really do at this point because there's no regulation uh, that, that, that controls the discharge of these. Uh, and, and it's a while before they get here. So the rights to clean water could be used as a stopgap to kind of force uh, uh, the EPD to move a little quicker uh, uh, to, to regulate these emerging contaminants that we know are causing ecological and human health harm. Next slide, please. Uh, and uh, John mentioned a little bit about the Sable Trail pipeline earlier uh, as it related to Florida, but in Georgia, uh, this is an example of how having standing uh, would have been useful. So the Georgia House in 2016 voted uh, uh, overwhelmingly to deny the river easements for this pipeline. Uh, Sable Trail sued, uh, and then the state declined to defend their decision. And if we had had the right to clean water, that would have gave the, the citizens the right to kind of pick up that mantle that the state decided not to pick up and, and defend that decision. Next slide, please. And probably the most important 
uh, kind of gap filler I can think of is the protection of groundwater in Georgia. And I think it's probably the same for Florida. Um, the Clean Water Act is, is, is very useful and has been used for decades to help us protect our water resources, but there's definitely uh, you know, some gaps in this protection. And one of them is the protection of groundwater. And in Georgia, south of the fall line, most everyone gets their water from uh, the Floridian Aquifer. Uh, and protecting that uh, uh, resource is, is so important for not only our economy, but also our, the public health. Um, so drinking water protection um, uh, is very important. And uh, back to the PFAS issue, uh, this would help protect our drinking water from, from that emerging um, contaminant that we're already seeing that have multiple issues in different areas of the state. Um, and also help with our coal ash issue. So there's, there's current, um, 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 I, I guess, back and forth with EPD and EPA about how best to deal with uh, Georgia Power's coal ash, uh, which a lot of it is being stored now in, in groundwater. Um, there's evidence that's already contaminated people's drinking wells in certain areas. Uh, and the right to clean water would help uh, at the state level to force uh, uh, Georgia EPD to kind of um, to pull back and require Georgia Power to, to protect our groundwater from this coal ash. Uh, also, uh, you think about not only uh, quality of groundwater, but quantity is a huge issue uh, in South Georgia. Uh, a lot of the irrigation uh, center pivots are pulling uh, and reducing the amount of groundwater. A lot of that groundwater um, uh, makes its way up to our surface waters and impacts flow. Land application systems are really lightly regulated in Georgia for uh, agriculture, municipal, and industrial reasons. Uh, this is another example of how our state regulators have failed us. Um, lots of pollution issues, and a lot of that is groundwater moving into surface water. So a lot of times the Clean Water Act is not applicable. Uh, this right to clean water could fill that gap. And then it would give us the opportunity for science to kind of lead the way. Uh, instead of waiting for uh, regulatory, the slow regulatory nature of our government to catch up with the science, uh, we know PFOS is dangerous. We know it's harming people. Um, you know, it kind of give us that opportunity to, to, to lead with science instead of bureaucracy. So in pretty much every instance to protect our health and our water resources, the right to clean water uh, would assist us. Next slide. I think it's uh, possible that we lost John. I don't see him on my screen. So I'll introduce myself. I'm, I'm Gordon Rogers. I'm the riverkeeper for the Flint. And uh, before that, I was riverkeeper for the Satilla back to 2004. And uh, I also have a lot of experience um, prior to being a riverkeeper uh, as, a, as a policy analyst for the state inside of Georgia DNR. And I was also in the regulated community for nine years in the waste and demolition business. Uh, next slide, please, Henry. Um, the Georgia way um, is, is pretty straightforward, but it's not easy, and it does not involve a statewide petition. There's no, there's no route of that nature. Um, we do have a lot of experience in Georgia amending our Constitution. In fact, we've done it 89 times since we established our Constitution, so we know how to do it in Georgia, and we're not shy about it, but it's nevertheless not easy. Uh, generally speaking, uh, a bill must be introduced to the General Assembly. It needs to have majority leadership, that's best, but it also has to have strong bipartisan support because it has to get a super majority, a, a two thirds majority in both chambers, the House and the Senate. Um, and pa our past experience with this sort of thing, and we have some recently, in the environmental community, 
indicates that it takes between five and 20 years of work typically, and that it, uh, um, it needs to have very broad support outside the legislature among conservation groups, property rights groups, good government advocates, uh, rural folks, urban folks. These things are a must. Um, also resolutions from counties and cities have pro proven useful in the past. Um, to give their legislative delegations courage uh, in these sorts of situations. In Georgia, um, the, the two environmental um, amendments that I mentioned, um, it both involve dedication of funds. Um, one is a series of taxes that are, uh, have been now dedicated to land acquisition. That required a constitutional amendment. And the other one most recently was a, a, is a series of fees everything from spay and neuter fees and super speeder fees to environmental fees that are now dedicated to the trust funds that uh, they purported to be dedicated to, to begin with, but now finally are. And uh, both of those amendments that were environmentally related um, received support well in excess of 75% of the voters and by definition had to have a two thirds majority um, in the House and the Senate. Um, so next slide, please. Um, the Georgia Rights to Hunt and Fish Amendment, which was passed in 2005, an amendment to the Constitution, shows not only a, a constitutional pathway, perhaps, but also a formula and a, an excellent foundation, we think, um, to build on a Montana style campaign. And what I mean by that is a strongly transpartisan or bipartisan campaign. Also, right to clean water language could actually be sistered onto the existing right to hunt and fish language in the Georgia constitution uh, if we manage the politics well. Of course, that's always a question mark. Next slide, please. Um, I'm not talking about this uh, in, a, in a frivolous way. Um, it's because of uh, the connections that we see in other states and also how seriously Georgians take their rights to hunt and fish. And here's what that amendment says. And I think if you just think about it for a moment, that this imp these important traditions and the economy that goes with it of, of, of hunting and fishing and the taking of fish and wildlife um, falls to pieces without a right to clean water. Um, so next slide, please. And in fact, 23 states have rights to hunt and fish and two others, California and Rhode Island, have rights to fish but not to hunt. And uh, this goes back as far as 1777 before there even was a country. Um, but the good folks of Vermont apparently thought that that was important enough back then to go ahead and put it in their founding documents. And it has happened as recently as 2020 um, with, with most of these being in the 1990s and 2000s. Next slide, please. One of these, Montana notably, also has the right to clean water embedded in it. And I, I find that to be very, very important and perhaps instructive. Um, next slide, please. A little bit of language there from the Montana right to hunt and fish. And the next slide, please. And a Georgia right to clean water amendment could be this simple, but for the reasons that John elaborated on um, and the experience in Pennsylvania shows us that perhaps we don't want it to be this simple. That's going to require some work and some debate, um, but it could be this simple. Next slide, please. So how to do it in Georgia, um, build as big a tent as possible. Um, 
all of the counties and cities that have already done water trail resolutions, and there are a lot of them in Georgia, uh, are candidates as supporters, cultivating our hunting, fishing, farming, and forestry friends, the realtors even. Um, these, are, these are methods that we're already familiar with in the in Georgia, Georgia environmental community. We've already done this kind of work. Next slide, please. Um, Henry, I think you skipped the Q&A slide. Yeah, I think we did. I think it went right over it. Yes, I went, I went too far. That did not feel correct. And I think we're done. Um, so in terms of the formal presentation, and I flip it back to John and Henry to moderate the Q&A. Uh, yeah, I, I was here. I was having a, a sound issue, but uh, you did you did it great there, Gordon. Thank you. So it's time for questions. Who's got some questions? Well, let me start. Chuck, what's going on with that lawsuit? Well, John, we have a hearing next Tuesday, April twenty sixth. Uh, we we sued the Florida Department. of and environmental protection and the developer uh, over filling in over 100 acres of wetlands. And that hearing is going to be on the, the DEP and the uh, developers' motions to dismiss. So they're, they're trying to get the case thrown out early uh, based on the preemption that was passed by the Florida legislature that said that no local government can pass basically a, a right to clean water law. Uh, and what we're saying is that there's a foundational constitutional right um, of the citizens of Florida to a clean and healthy environment. That, that came out of a ruling by the Florida Wildlife Federation uh, uh, lawsuit. So, uh, basically, what we're saying is that the legislature can't change the Constitution without the approval of 60% of the Florida voters. So it, it's, uh, uh, we're, we're duking it out. Um, it's, we may have an answer <clears throat> next Tuesday, or the judge could take it under advisement. But, um, it, you know, we're, we're, we're deep in it. We have a team of lawyers working on our end. And of course, DEP is fighting on behalf of the developer uh, in this case, which you, hmm. I, it's kind of an interesting thing. The Department of Environmental Protection is fighting on the side of the developer and against the uh, local citizens who want to have clean water. Well, you know, it's sometimes called the Department of Excessive Permitting. <laughs> Yes, there are a lot of different uh, words for those acronyms, and some of them I can say on this call. Uh -huh. uh, others I'll, I'll reserve for private conversation. Mm -hmm. Well, here's one for the panelists. Um, can you think of any other examples of anticipatory and preventative uses of the right to clean water? I can see Gordon thought of one. Um, John, when we were discussing this the other night, I, I shared a thought that was perhaps not well formed, but the more I thought about it, the more, more sense it makes to me. And as you recall, we did not have an attorney on the call. Um, uh, I guess that was yesterday, um, but Chris is with us now. Um, so Chris, um, I'm going to throw a couple of notions out there on anticipatory protections and uh, just see how you respond to this. Um, we have sort of a layer cake of aquifers in southwest Georgia. Um, we have three water supply aquifers underneath the Floridan, which uh, in the Albany area is the sufficial aquifer. And uh, they're not heavily exploited, 
but you could you can envision a scenario where our environmental regulatory agency, EPD, began to grant permits uh, without sufficient, sufficient knowledge of the sustainable yield of those aquifers. Um, and you can further envision a scenario where an advocacy group or some other group of citizens, if there were a right to clean water, in Georgia, uh, filed a constitutional suit that basically said, you're handing out permits um, like this is some sort of free rodeo, Georgia EPD, and you don't know how many permits at what volumes would lead to a diminution of this aquifer. So Chris, I'm presenting two questions to you here. The first one is, the right to clean water include things that are purely volumetric and have nothing to do with pollution. Um, and can uh, a lawsuit uh, under, under such a constitutional amendment be, be truly anticipatory uh, and try to block a permitting action that has not actually caused damage yet or a whole series of permitting actions? So for the first question is if a right to clean water could cover something that is not related to pollution but related to the extraction of water and the distraction of extraction of certain volumes could cause harm to the aquifer. Um, that I would imagine would be depending on how the constitution is drafted and then how also how, how it's interpreted by the courts. Um, so you know I can't <laughs> really answer that question for you unless we have specific language and case law that are looking at it. Um, yeah, it depends on how the courts would interpret it. And, you know, if we lay it down real nice and clear that it does include that sort of stuff, then um, they probably likely interpret it to do so. And if not, then it's more up in the air potentially. Um, and then for whether something like in this case, the, your scenario, the agency is giving out all these permits without the proper knowledge of the potential harms. And it seems like the environmental groups are convinced that there will be potential harms. Um, and then so prefacing this with, it depends on the court and how they interpret this. Um, Pennsylvania law would be persuasive authority, but not mandatory authority. So that you could, the court could be persuaded by Pennsylvania. Uh, of course, they don't have to follow it. It's not mandatory because it's another state. Um, but you know, with the Pennsylvania, they had that case where they look kind of like this. This kind of seems gap filler to me. Um, and in that case, the court ruled that they couldn't um, do something. They couldn't waive these requirements, these buffer requirements, because they didn't have the necessary standards in place. So I mean, it's possible the court could rule you don't have enough knowledge, you don't have enough standards to say you can only give out this a certain amount of permits. So essentially you guys can't be doing this until you have that, until you fill in that gap. Um, but as an individual person and attorney, you really can't be giving, you direct, giving anyone direct answers on this because uh, it's gonna come down to what the courts say. But that's just some, some thoughts for y'all. Thank you. So. Possible and possible, and the maybe answer, the favorite answer of the attorney. Um, can I ask a follow-up question to Chuck or Dave? I recall at least last year's version of the Florida Right Clean Water Amendment included the flow of the waters, not just contamination, but adequate flow. Um, I forget, is that in the current draft? Yes, it is. And it's, it's what we have is a definition of harm. And then, you know, the violation is, is you know, uh, would be by uh, a party that is, is, uh, is harming or threatening to harm a water body. Yeah, John, the definition the, of harm includes, includes, would include uh, the level of, you know, affecting the level of the water. You know, to go back to, to Chris's answer, it depends on how you write the uh, amendment in, in the case of the Orange County Charter Amendment, the uh, four rights that were bestowed upon the waterways are recognized 
does the right to exist, flow, be protected against pollution and to maintain a healthy ecosystem. So in, in Gordon's uh, example, uh, an individual could sue the EPD for granting uh, uh, excessive permits that would impact the flow of, of uh, the, the, the groundwaters as, as well as the surface waters. Um, in, in case I didn't mention, Chuck is also an attorney. No, I'm not. I just You're play not? one. I'm just spending okay. the night here in Tallahassee uh, at a Holiday Inn Express. So no, okay. I'll stop saying that. <laughs> I have seen Chuck arrive at the right conclusion uh, on, on issues of law long before many lawyers have. So yeah. <laughs> I, I've, I've had a lot of experience in courtrooms, I'll, I'll, I'll put it that way, uh, a, lot of, a lot of court cases here. Uh, but um, yeah, it's, it's that, that right to flow, um, you know, I would recommend because we're in the early stages uh, of drafting. Uh, we am saying, you know, you all are in the early stages of drafting the actual language. And um, I, I think that's important to include uh, because it, 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 as, as we grow in agriculture and population, uh, excessive pumping is, is going to become an issue. And uh, you know, certainly uh, it is in Florida and I think it will be in Georgia as well. Uh, it's already an issue in South Georgia. All the state uh, water councils have to deal with it. True, true. Um, do we have other questions? We're actually at 8.02, so we should be thinking about wrapping up. Uh, well, I thought of a question that came up yesterday when we were talking, and somebody asked if, a, do courts ever, are they ever able to make decisions that would impose on the state legislature to budget more money toward a, you know, something that would protect the water quality? Um, is, is that something that would be a situation that, that is allowed by, you know, can a court, do they have the power to do that? I guess it's, that's a separation of powers question, I guess, in a way, yeah. Can a court compare Does anyone know? to fund an environmental protection agency to do its job? Yes, it kind of is, but it oftentimes that does entail, you know, giving them the budget to do their job, doesn't it? Compelling an agency to do something and then compelling the legislature to do something is a little different. Um, the, the question of the legislature that just seems like a lot of red flags. I don't know, but um, doesn't I don't think so. I don't know, really, you know, that's probably, probably covered that in con law or something, but it doesn't yeah. seem like I don't know. It doesn't seem like a would be a good thing that, or it doesn't seem like it could happen, but I don't know, I don't know. Well, I, I, the fish kill made me think of that. You know, um, Damon had mentioned the, the Ogeechee River fish kill. And I, I remember when there hundreds of people showed up, you know, at these public hearings they had about that. And a bunch of people from the EPD were up on the stage, you know, take, you know, but they were under fire, you know, by a lot of angry people. And there were a bunch of legislators and Buddy Carter was a state legislator back then, but now he's a, now he's a congressman. And he, he and a bunch of other legislators were at, all at the back of the room because I, I got there late, so I was at the back of the room. And I noticed the back at the back of the room with me were all these state legislators, local state legislators, and they were just hiding in the back. And I, I went up to them and I said, you know, how come you guys aren't up there on the stage with the EPD guys? Because you're just as responsible for this fish kill as they are you know, because you're the ones that keep cutting back the funding, you know, to make it so that, you know, they're more capable of doing a better job. And um, I remember that they got a little bit upset with me when I told them that. But uh, so anyway, I just think it's food for thought, you know, but that that's purely political, isn't it? So I guess it's, 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 uh, I don't know. Karen, I, I, I'm sorry. I, well, I, 
just to speak a little bit to that, I think that the legislators can mandate the, the, the regulatory agencies to do certain things, right? Uh, and, and, and pass laws and to, to require them to do things. A, a uh, uh, unintended consequences of that is they need more funding, if that makes sense. So kind of, yeah. kind of a backdoor way. I doubt that if that makes sense. So they, they can mandate them to do things, and then uh, you know, then they would be obligated uh, to to provide the funding, or it wouldn't happen. So it's kind of the way I see that happening. Karen, I think you hit the nail on the head. That that's a, that's a political question, and uh, Chris seemed um, reticent to give you a clear answer. Just like a good lawyer, he seemed reticent to give you a clear answer on that. <laughs> but I do, I agree with him that I think the answer is no uh, in Georgia, and it's very clear in the Constitution in Georgia. The legislature, not even the governor, the legislature has um, authority over the budget and, and within the legis within the georgia legislature all spending bills have to start in the house they can be modified by the senate but the senate can't even start the process uh it's, it's started in the house um uh, so I, I think chris is right i can tell you what what we decided um after looking at the best way to handle the situation. And by the way, we're limited by the concept in Florida of having have a single subject uh, for a constitutional amendment. Um, so we had to pick one branch of government to, you know, that is the one that we consider the most guilty of, of causing, you know, or of allowing pollution to cause. And that has to be, for, you know, from our standpoint, the executive branch, because they're the ones who are supposed to execute the laws. We've got all sorts of great laws on the books for protecting our water. They just don't get, get you know, get actually put into operation. Um, and if you do go to sue the government uh, for not fulfilling the law in Florida, uh, it goes through what's called our administrative law system. The administrative law judges are all uh, are all appointed by um, the uh, the governor, and they are essentially managed by the uh, the uh, secretary of FDP. And the FDEP secretary um, is of course also appointed by the governor. So in essence, this is a completely executive you know uh, way of dealing with any environmental issue. The solution to that was, is and what we put in this latest version of the uh, amendment is that um, the governor, members of the of his cabinet or her cabinet, um, members of the uh, um, all members of all executive agencies, which include FDEP, FWC, um, basically uh, FDAX. I mean, any 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 executive agency um, can be sued for not properly uh, executing the law. So that's what we've gone after. Now, if we've got an individual that pollutes, how do we deal with that? Well, they're polluting one of two ways. Either they don't, have, either they were given a, a permit by the state to pollute, or the state just instantly enforcing the law and preventing them from polluting. So we can still go after the state and stop the pollution. It's a slower way, maybe in a more indirect way, but in, in essence, you, you sue them a few times and uh, they have to pay your lawyer costs. And I think they're gonna change policy. That's how we're looking at it at least. Karen, uh, I, I had one example for you that uh, might be a parallel to your question. Uh, in Tallahassee, the uh, city of Tallahassee was sued for polluting uh, Wakulla Springs. And they did a uh, dye trace study from the spray fields uh, where wastewater was being sprayed on the spray fields and traced it to uh, Wakulla Springs. So in that case, uh, uh, they were sued under the Clean Water Act uh, and the, the dye trace study showed that yes, it was directly causing pollution to the uh, Wakulla Springs. And uh, they were compelled to spend, I, I believe somewhere in the neighborhood of $200 million denitrifying the water uh, before it hit the spray fields. So can, can uh, this kind of thing compel a legislature to spend money? Um, uh, like Chris said, that, 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 that would be a tough one, but 
certainly local actors uh, like cities uh, can be compelled to spend money uh, to clean up their waterways. Turns out this is a big controversy in um, Maricopa County, Arizona about school funding, which is actually had a voter improved income tax on um, Arizona's to fund. So that's going back and forth. But at the very least, if there's a right to clean water in the state constitution, that's something that legislators trying to get funding for the environmental agency can say, look, we got this right to clean water. We got to fund the agency to actually do its job. You know, it's at least got rhetorical use. Mm -hmm. Be not that it could have some more teeth to it, but uh, yeah, separation of powers, it uh, seems to enter in here, right? Eh? Okay, we're at uh, eight eleven, and we started about seven oh five. Um, I think, in the interest of not tearing everybody out, while the conversation is very interesting, perhaps we should consider wrapping it up. Okay. Yeah, I don't hear anybody saying yes, yes. Let's go for another hour. <laughs> So, Heidi, um, the recording is, uh, has been made, and uh, as soon as we can ret retrieve it from Zoom's cloud, post, walls will post the recording and the slides and PDF and um, PowerPoint versions on the public website so everyone can see them. And we'll use that to try to wrestle up more interest in this topic in Georgia. And if anybody wants to see more about Florida, I believe, David, it's the day after tomorrow. You're holding a press conference at Poe Springs Park. And so you and I will be two of the speakers. Yep, I'm looking forward to meeting you then, uh, John, and um, telling everybody about our amendment. Sounds like a plan. So sure. thanks, everybody, for coming. And um, hope you enjoyed it. I know I did. Thank you, John. Yeah, thank you. That's a good All right. thank you so much. Special, special thanks to you, Chuck, for being with us. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Cord. Good to see you again, Chuck. Good seeing you, Dave.